Um, again, good morning, everyone. My name is Albert A. Palacios, and I am the Digital Scholarship Coordinator at Lila Benson Latin American Studies and Collections at the University of Texas at Austin. I want to thank you for joining us today for our fall installment of the Lila Benson Digital Scholarship in the Americas Speaker Series. Um, each year, uh, the Lila Benson Digital Scholarship Office showcases the work of scholars who are engaging uh, with digital lenses to innovate scholarship in Latin American, U.S. Latina, African diaspora, and indigenous studies. Today, I have the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Katia Chordnik, who will be uh, who will be sharing with us a digital project she leads, uh, titled Cantos Cautivos or Captive Songs in English. The project compiles over 160 testimonies of music activities and music pieces composed performed and listened to in 37 political detention centers that existed in Chile during uh, General Augusto Pinochet's uh, dictatorship from 1973 to 1990. Dr. Katia Chornik is uh, the Impact Development Manager at Kingston University and Research Associate at Cambridge University Center of Latin American Studies. Her research focuses on Latin American cultural history, and she is the author of Alejo Carpentier and the Musical Text, which was published by Rutledge in 2015. And uh, she's the author of Captive Songs, Music and Political Detention in Pinochet's Chile, uh, which is a forthcoming publication from Oxford University Press. She also serves, uh, she not only co-founded, but she also serves as the editor of the digital project Cantos Cautivos, which she will be talking about this morning. So without further ado, I seat the metaphorical microphone to Dr. Katia Chodny to share her project with us. Thanks very much, Albert, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are. Uh, for me, it's, uh, well, it's completely dark here in London. And thank you very much all for, for coming. It's, it's a great pleasure to share um, this uh, morning, afternoon, or evening with with you. So, first, first quick question: Do you all see my screen? We do. We see it. Great. My PowerPoint. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we do. Good. Good. So, um, uh, the plan for this talk is to offer first a very brief historical contextualization for those who are not familiar with Chilean recent history and outline my, my broader research on the topic. Um, after that, I will provide um, a, an overview of the Canto Cautivos archives content. Um, and while I share some examples, I will talk through the, the structure of the platform. Um, I will then discuss how the project uh, came about and the strategies we have used to obtain and promote materials and drive engagement. Um, and finally, I will ref I shall reflect on the challenges and, and opportunity that a project such as Canto Cautivos can generate for digital scholarship. So what you were hearing while, um, while you entered the, this virtual room uh, was uh, Victor Jara's El Derecho de Vivir en Paz, or the right to live in peace. Um, uh, Victor Jara was, was one of the uh, key figures of the New Song Movement, um, which came to light in the 60s during a period of political struggle across Latin America. And, and this movement played a, a key role during the campaign and presidency of Salvador Allende, uh, who was the first socialist to be democratically elected and the first to attempt a transition to socialism through peaceful means, uh, this so-called the Chilean road to socialism. Uh, backed by the uh, popular unity coalition of left-wing parties, uh, Allende sets uh, an ambitious program of social, economic, and political changes in motion. Uh, it deepened agrarian, the agrarian reform process initiated by previous administrations and expropriated many strategic businesses. Social spending caused a growing deficit in public funds, generating an inflationary process aggravated by severe supplies issues, hoarding, corporate sabotage, and strike actions in various sectors of the economy. 
Allende should have remained in office until 1976. Uh, uh, sorry, opposition. The opposition's hope for a constitutional impeachment to remove him earlier. Yet the results of parliamentary elections of um, in March, held in March 1973, uh, which achieved a high support for the left, meant that it would not be possible to impeach Allende. In June 1973, a military coup attempt supported by some sectors of the opposition was crushed. Augusto Pinochet, who was then general chief of staff of the army, um, let the crackdown on anti the protests, and here you see him on the left side of the photo. Um, Allende then promoted Pinochet to commander in chief of the army. Sorry, Allende is on the right. Uh, Allende planned to call a referendum on his permanence in office, yet his idea could not come to fruition as the armed forces overthrew his government on September the 11th. The coup was a historical rupture that would have consequences for many generations. The coup was led by Pinochet with the support from the US government and the CIA. Allende retreated with followers to the presidential palace, which tanks and infantry had surrounded. Allende killed himself after uh, the aerial attack uh, as troops stormed the burn, burning palace. Ajunta, uh, led by Pinochet rule with iron fist. Using the national security doctrine as an ideological basis, it was characterized by human rights violations on a massive scale. The breakdown of the democratic system, the dissolution of the Congress, the banning of political parties and union, the restriction of civil rights, massive dismissals, and military discipline imposed in workplaces and educational institutions. Over a thousand centers for political detention and torture existed in Pinochet's Chile, including prisons, camps, clandestine houses, stadiums, and police and armed forces units. Some of these facilities were run by the armed forces, the secret services, and the military, militarized police force. Other compounds were administered by the prison service and civil collaborators. 94% of political prisoners suffered torture, according to Chile's National Commission on Political Imprisonment and Torture. Pinochet radically changed the economy, turning Chile into the first country where the neoliberalist doctrine was tested and applied on a massive scale. From 1983 on, mass protests coupled with mounting international pressure forced Pinochet to hold a referendum on his permanence in power in October 1988. As he lost, presidential and parliamentary elections were held in December 1989. Pinochet remained in command of the army for another 10 years. In October 1998, during a visit to the UK, Pinochet was arrested by the Metropolitan Police after an international warrant was issued for extradition to Spain, indicting him for human rights violations. After 503 days under arrest, the British government released him on the grounds of fragile health. In 2005, the Chilean Supreme Court voted to remove his immunity and consider him fit to stand trial for fraud and embezzlement of public funds. Yet Pinochet never faced the courts or served a prison sentence. He died in 2006. Musicians were particularly targeted by the dictatorship. Victor Jara, one of the most influential artists of Latin America, was tortured and killed in the national, in the Estadio Chile in Santiago. Jorge Peña Gen, a classical music composer, conductor and pedagogue, whose work has been highly influential in the global youth orchestra movement to the present day, was murdered at La Serena Jail in the so-called Caravan of Death. Ángel Parra, the son of Violeta Parra, among other artists, was sent to the Chacabuc concentration camp in the Atacama Desert. Other, others narrowly escaped detention and went into hiding or escaped through foreign embassies. Unlike the stories of these artists, the musical experiences of tens of thousands of political prisoners in Pinochet's Chile, particularly non-musicians, are not widely known. My research has enabled me to look not only at the musical engagement of musicians and non-musicians in turn, but also that of 
agents of Pinochet's regimes uh, who operated in, in these places. So, so uh, I've interviewed two former members of the uh, secret police services, one very junior um, from the uh, first police, uh, secret police, the DINA, and the second one was uh, um, uh, is, um, um, served um, in the second uh, service, the CNI, and held an incredibly um, a senior position. Um, and um, on top of that, he is a, a very prolific singer and writer. Uh, so far, I have found evidence of music activity in 37 political detention centers. Many inmates had musical experiences of some form, whether passive or active, uh, while in detention. And here, um, a, 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 a couple of uh, a small number of, of images. On the left um, is a group formed uh, in a Chacabuco concentration camp. Uh, on the right uh, is a poster with the winning songs of a song contest that mimicked the uh, international song contest of Viña del Mar um, at Ritoque. Uh, so the, this um, uh, uh, contest was a Ritoque camp very close uh, um, to Viña del Mar. Uh, and here uh, we've got on the left and top the uh, um, uh, different styles of um, notation, music notation of uh, um, uh, uh, um, a man called Alfonso Padilla, um, who transcribed a very famous work called Cantata Santa Maria de Quiques. Uh, he didn't know how to write music first, um, and so he only transcribed uh, the um, the main note of, of court and and uh, in detention he taught himself how to write on the stave and here on on the on the top uh, you have a, a more evolved uh, um, type of, of notation and at the bottom uh, is a very um, uh, interesting uh, uh, document it's a ten uh, bar um, unfinished melody by Jorge Benyagen you saw the photo before. Um, and uh, these uh, these uh, ten bars uh, were written um, by him shortly before he was executed. And the materiality of of this this uh, this document is, is quite incredible. As it was, as he didn't have uh, a pen or a pencil, he he used a, a burned match uh, to write uh, the music. Uh, Despite music was commonly present in political detention centers, for decades, survivors would often self-censor memories of the musical experiences uh, as only testimonies shedding lights on, on judicial investigations were, were valued. And I, I should have uh, said at the outset that I, I have a very um, close relationship with the, with the topic as both my parents were political prisoners uh, in Pinochet's um, um, detention centers uh, before I was, I was born. So this talk is mostly based on, on the last chapter of a of, uh, uh, um, forthcoming book, which I'm about to finish and submit. Uh, and, and all the chapters of, of, of my book deal with, uh, with the um, relationship between um, music and and torture and other mistreatment, not not just as 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 a, as a music as a as a, a a tool to exert harm, but also a tool to recover from harm. Uh, a, a second chapter deals with the, uh, the songs and the memories of Alvaro Corvalan, this very senior former um, uh, a secret agent I mentioned before, who is serving. Uh, um, um, uh, a life sentence in, in Chile. Um, a third chapter deals with um, uh, what I call memory cacophony, and I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about this later in this talk. Um, fourthly, uh, a, a chapter deal with grassroots singing, commemoration and revival, and that uh, chapter is focused on a choir uh, that was uh, um, first founded in, in Tres Alamos uh, camp, concentration camp uh, in 1975. 
and was later refounded uh, uh, in the run up to the uh, 40th anniversary of the coup and is still ongoing, uh, which is very interesting. Now, there's been a, a, a generational um, uh, rechange as, as, as well, a replacement, uh, but many of the original found, uh, members of the choir are still uh, a key part of, of that choir. Um, so, um, uh, if you haven't explored the um, uh, website yet, um, I suggest um, you do it while I'm talking. I mean, uh, later on, I'm, I, I, I like to do it a bit uh, interactive, this, this talk. So later I'll guide you through uh, through the different sections of this website. So pre very briefly, uh, Canto Cautivos is a born digital archival project uh, that compiles experiences of music writing, music performance, and music listening uh, in uh, political detention centers. I initiated this project in late 2014 and have led it um, um, since then. As of 2023, uh, the platform has 161 testimonies. 40 of these discuss experiences of writing new pieces or modifying pre-existing pre ones. 62 narrate experiences of listening to music and 113 refer to music performances experiences. Obviously, uh, uh, very often uh, a testimony will refer to more than one broad type of experiences. 63 former prisoners have shared their stories. Uh, there's also a small set of testimonies from children of detainees uh, who have memories of, of visiting um, their, their parents, imprisoned parents, and having memories of, 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 of the music that was performed then or on, on the way to, um, to, uh, to, 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 to these visits. Um, and, and this this small set is very interesting as they, they, they show the role of intergenerational music memory. The detention centers where these experiences took place were of various types, from clandestine torture houses to officially recognized prisons. The regions with the largest number of testimonies are Metropolitana, uh, Metropolitana region, where Santiago is, um, Valparaíso uh, in the central region of Chile, and Antofagasta in the very north. And we have taken the deliberate decision to exclude the voices of former agents of the dictatorship with repressive bodies. And I should um, clarify that um, 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 there are lots of testimonies um, I've collected, and many of these appear in my book, uh, that are not uh, uh, in the archive for various reasons, either because they were collected before the advent of the uh, of the um, uh, Canto Cautivo project, or because, uh, as I said, it, it is it was deemed inappropriate to uh, to put these testimonials there, or we had we we haven't uh, um, um, obtained consent. So I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and would invite you to um, um, uh, visit the archive with me. Uh, so um, can you um, open your browser? So it's, uh, sorry, I should, I should put the, um, the uh, URL here. I, I shared it in the, I shared it in okay, the chat. I shared it. Okay, anyway, put it in the chat. So if you could all go uh, to the testimony section uh, on your left is a menu. Now, if you are a Spanish speaker, you may well use a Spanish version. The uh, language button is at the very top right uh, of every uh, page. If you are non-Spanish speaker, maybe you stick to English. Uh, and I apologize to all the uh, people living in the US. It's all in British spelling. It's not spelling mistake, it's just British spelling. <laughs> uh, and so if you are there, testimony section, and you will see that all archive entries can be sorted by witness alphabetically or by publication date. Uh, and all entries are named after the main music piece, 
referred to in the testimonies, which can be listened through embedded videos. Um, so I would invite you to click on author to sort the testimonies by author and then go to the bottom, bottom of the page and then click on the last page. So that should be number seven. And uh, you will see the name Sergio Veseli, uh, who has a very large number of, um, of testimonies. And I would invite you to click on King Nyaka Nyaka or El Rey Nyaka Nyaka. I'm going to put the hyperlink in the chat anyway, in case someone got lost. And uh, this is an interesting uh, testimony and song. Uh, it's a, as you, uh, perhaps you can already hear the song. Um, it's a children's song and it pokes fun at, at Pinochet himself. So Sergio Veseli uh, wrote lots of songs uh, while in prison in seven different centers, uh, 25 in total. And uh, Nyaka Nyaka was a paper mache puppet representing a perfidious medieval king. Uh, made and used by inmates in shows to entertain children who would come to visit their captive parents. The king mistreats uh, his puppets prisoners who are called after handicraft objects made by the prisoners themselves. Uh, the first four stanzas are character assassination of, of, of King Nyaka Nyaka, and the last two describe the fall of the monarch and his regime and the emancipation of his subjects. And, and each stanza ends with a warning about the king. I hope you can listen to the song either now or, or later, it's, it's very amusing. So if you look at the, the actual page uh, under the testimony title, we, um, we show the author of the music piece and that of the testimony. In this case, it coincides and the place and dates of the experience narrated. Um, a hyperlink allows users to view a page containing a map with the geolocation of the detention center. A link to a page to the Museum of Memories uh, Recintos platform that um, um, so that that um, platform um, lists the official the the a thousand hundred and thirty two officially recognized um, um, places of political detention. Um, which uh, with further information about that camp compound um, and also a preview of all the testimonies on the Canto Captivos platform relating to that, that very same place. And so where a piece of music has lyrics, these are provided uh, below. I mean, not every um, piece uh, on the archive is, 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 is a song. Uh, we've got instrumental uh, pieces as well. Um, and tax at the bottom uh, allows you to find other testimonies relating to that same person, detention center and region. And, um, and what testimonies have mentioned victims and, and uh, uh, the definition, our definition of victims is those who are either disappeared or were executed. So basically it's, it's this certainty that, that, that they passed. Uh, we include them at the bottom of uh, and hyperlink them to um, another platform of the Museum of Memories, uh, which is called Victimas. Yeah. So if you can kindly click on the victims section, again, uh, you find it on the left um, of your page. If you click on victims, so this section contains the photographs and names of 28 people. 28 people who were killed or disappeared. Uh, the total number is several thousands, but uh, those uh, uh, who are featured on our website are only the ones um, who are mentioned in Cantabotio's testimonies. So if, if you click on a photograph of the name or a name, you are taken to a page containing a preview of testimonies relating to that very same victim and a hyperlink to a victim, to that victim's page on the Museum of Memories Victimas site. So if, if you could kindly click, find the name Marcelo Concha, uh, click on it, please. 
And then click on El Suertudo or Lucky Devil. And again, I'm going to uh, put the hyperlink in the chat just in case someone got lost. Um, one second, please. Oh, sorry, I, I've just seen your your um your message, Albert. Um, yes, I could. Um, let me. One second, please. Um, so, can you see my screen? Can you see the website? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm just going to cheat and I'm just going to find, uh, the testimony here. Uh, so this is this is uh, this is interesting also because of the recording. I mean, we have we have uh, recordings, copies of recordings of two different cassettes uh, recorded at, at uh, Chacabuco camp. Uh, one was well known from before because I had Barra took it um, um, outside um, Chile when he was exiled. But this this another one that was digitized especially for the uh, was found late and digitized especially for the the um, the project. Uh, and uh, here this we've got a testimony of one of the members of the uh, the group that um, that uh, recorded this piece, and also one of the co-authors of the of the lyrics. So this this is an example of uh, 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 a pre-existing piece uh, with completely new uh, new lyrics, and this this practice has been used uh, in in many different contexts, not not just in detention context, but also football chants. I mean, it's, 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 uh, there are so many that that simply remake uh, previous previous piece. So this is this is a very humorous uh, piece as well. Um, uh, uh narrating the experiences of of a political prisoner and um uh, talks about about um the um the arrival um the the, the treatment but it's in a very humorous humorous way and also complains about a, a diet the effects of the uh, a diet based on on beans and and if you could uh, kindly um put hover your mouth over any word or expression that is underlined you will see that uh, it has a definition where well, actually we we we've we've, uh, we've um uh we've uh, created an embedded hundred of 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 definitions of of various things uh, from from uh, well in this case there's a lot of coded language uh, but uh, things like cueca, cueca is 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 a national uh, dance and, and music genre of, of Chile. But uh, outside Chile, is unlikely to um, uh, to be known. Uh, well, sorry, I, sh I should say Bolivia and, and Argentina, though it's not as popular as in Chile. But also, uh, our audience is multi generational, so many of the names um, of um, people's names, uh, political figures' names, uh, and so on, uh, may known for uh, my parents' generations or my generation, but not uh, by, by younger generation. Um, so I'm going to, oh yes, one one more thing I'd like you to, to do is to go to your, share, to the share your memories um, section. And this is a crowdsourcing page. As you can see, there are some guidelines on the left. And there is a, uh, this is the form that, that people uh, fill in and where they share their, their memories. They can also send uh, audio um, and images. And um, we never uh, publish anything automatically. Um, um, we edit. Um, I mean, first we have to ensure that it doesn't contain anything um, offensive 
Um, and uh, we may add explanations. We have to translate uh, the, 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 the entire um, material. And um, yeah, a, 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 a contributors are always given the, uh, we, they're always shown a, a, an edited draft uh, for, for their approval. And uh, if they wish, they may add um, or delete or amend things of the, um, of the original te testimony. So I'm going to share my PowerPoint again. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yeah? Yes. So most stories in the archive concern ordinary musicians and people with no music skills who due to circumstances had ended up having uh, musical experiences. Um, music Narrated uh, musical experiences are often interlaced um, with a range of topics, and these are the uh, most common ones. Um, the ARCA contains numerous references to music with explicit political content, uh, many of which were composed or recorded by new song artists from Chile and, and, and other countries. Um, yet browsing through the Canto Cotivos Arca reveals many examples of non-political repertoire. Censorship in some facilities and prisoners' avoidance of certain pieces may partly explain the presence of songs on topics such as romantic love, home, nature, religious music, and so on. And so some of these songs circulated as coded messages and the repertoire chosen by detainees had variable levels of consistency with the political ethos and views, um, songs in fashions at the time and those that were meaningful to people's sound identities well beyond political militancy were sung deliberately or by chance and, and on occasions causing ideological dissonance. So for, this, this is a very interesting testimony of someone who, uh, who was an atheist and ended up uh, in a choir singing, singing uh, religious songs uh, in detention. Uh, group singing of pre-existing music was the most common activity. Um, Canto Cautivo's testimonies allude to a very eclectic repertoire um, originated in 19 different countries uh, in South, Central and North America and Europe, uh, spanning a period of five centuries from Renaissance music to 1980s pop. And here um, I've, I've boldened the countries with, uh, more, uh, with the most prevalence. Uh, unfortunately, the US is, is, is not one of them, but Mexico is. Um, from the US, uh, there are a couple of stories around We Shall Overcome, uh, both from the South, uh, if my memory doesn't fail me. And there is a cover uh, of a song by uh, the US band, The Turtles. Uh, the song is Elena, but it's not, it's it, the, 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 the version that was uh, 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 popular in Chile was not that one, but was a cover in Italian with completely new uh, lyrics by someone called uh, Gianni Morandi, uh, which, well, the lyrics are completely different. And, and from Mexico, we've got testimonies around La Delita, Las Mañanitas, El Reloj, Échame la Culpa, Échame a mí la Culpa, and Volver, Volver. Um, I wanted to show, uh, to share, um, to discuss a little bit, uh, to discuss El Volver Volver, because uh, it's, it, it's a, a, um, a story about listening, uh, but I'm a bit scared of running out of time. So I'll leave you to explore it. Um, if you just put Volver Volver in the search box, You'll, you'll get it very uh, easily. Um, actually, I could, 
I'll, I'll, I'll share the, the link later on. Um, as expected, certain pieces are recalled by more than one person. The most frequently remembered pieces are Chile's national anthem and Libre or Free, uh, which was popularized in 1972 by the Spanish singer Nino Bravo. Most entries uh, um, on Canto Cautivos refer to music pieces and memories about music that may not have a particular purpose or use, or that are funny or witty, as examples we've seen, uh, deviating from canonical stories of political imprisonment, which are so often trust tragic. And uh, in the archive and outside the archive, I've collected um, uh, stories about that are, are about or are voiced by characters that are non-conventional in testimonies of political imprisonment. So for instance, there is a, there is a very a hilarious story about about Julio Iglesias um, 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 in Valparaíso jail. He he had a kind of Johnny Cash moment, and uh, didn't didn't go well. Um, so so this is a, a, a I mean this, this is a very very vivid. Um, um, memory, collective memory of this episode. Unfortunately, we don't have Julio Iglesias' voice, himself, although he did give an interview uh, for a newspaper in which he referred to his. But uh, but but for instance, I interviewed the the uh, the presenter of that event, um, uh, and for me, yeah. So these these are these are not voices that appear very very commonly in in these testimonies. And so for these kind of stories or voices, and uh, I, I, I coined the notion of memory cacophony, uh, which, which may be loose ends and counterintuitive, and they provide a, a counterpoint to some of the most emblematic memories of the dictatorship, such as memory of salvation, memory of rupture, memory of persecution and awakening, and memory as closed box, as summarized by historian Steve Stern. Oh, sorry, I forgot to share the most common music genres in, uh, in Canto Cautillo's testimonies. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the history of the project. The early stages were developed in collaboration with Chile's Museum of Memory and Human Rights as part of a Leverhulme fellowship I had at, at Manchester University. But really the, 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 the history traces back to the early 2010s. Um, uh, and at that time, I became increasingly concerned about the rapidly diminishing number of survivors and the practicality of reaching as many people as possible in the quickest possible time. Um, at the time I was conducting most of that of my research in situ and, and, and then uh, video communication platforms were not commonly used as, as nowadays. Um, uh, further, I, I wanted to include survivors based in different parts of Chile and around the world. Uh, many political detainees who subsequently experience exile under Pinochet still live abroad and traveling around the world to collect their stories was not really feasible for me. Um, in late 2013, on the request of the Museum of, of Human Rights, I tested and contributed to um, the very first online crowdsourcing project called Memoria de Exilio, I'm going to share the URL later, uh, which would soon be launched. This experience um, prompted me to think that digital media could be a suitable method for speeding up the process of collecting materials for my own research. So I proposed to the museum my idea of starting an, an online crowdsourcing project um, and they agreed uh, that we would work together. Um, this, this partnership lasted until 20, uh, 2016. 
Um, the first version of the Canto Cotillo was, website was on, um, on, on WordPress and uh, was developed by the museum uh, closely following the uh, Memorias de Exilio project. And uh, it was first launched in Santiago in January 2015. Uh, some of the survivors who contributed to the planning of the platform and a handful of others uh, we contacted by word of mouth share their very first testimonies. Uh, shortly after, before the event, the launch event, we initiated a press campaign that resulted in substantial media coverage, as well as many contributions from survivors who learned about the project through the press. So most of these contributions were from ex-prisoners living in Santiago, which showed that the information about the project did not effectively reach other areas of the country where regional media outlets are often preferred by the local population. So it became clear to me that in addition to promoting the project in events outside the capital, there was a need to address various challenges around online crowdsourcing that hindered participation. Although we made the website as simple, as user-friendly as, as we could, and tested it extensively with volunteers, some potential contributors had basic IT competence gaps that prevented them from uh, sending the contributions online. Furthermore, not everyone interested in contribution to Canto Cautivos had access to computers and good internet connection. Communication and psychological barriers relating to crowd, the crowdsourcing methodology became evident too. As contributors are encouraged to send their experiences in written form, they are only able to employ propositional language as a result of which prosody and nonverbal communication cannot be conveyed and subjectivity diminishes or disappears. At first, I offered those wanting to contribute to the project but not keen on the online crowdsourcing method, the possibility of being interviewed, as I used to do before the Canto Cautillo's project began. While they were happy to be interviewed, they made it clear that they wanted their stories published on the Canto Cautillo's platform. And the wishes pose a, a dilemma. So the question was, should we combine different collecting methods for Canto Cautillo's, or should we stick with online crowdsourcing only for the platform while continuing conducting interviews for the broader research. Uh, in the ensuing months, uh, it was decided that Canto Cautivos should be open to using different methods for collecting materials and to meet um, contributors' access needs and wishes. So to online crowdsourcing, we added edited interviews and oral testimonies and music performances delivered in public events when explicit consent to record and use these materials online was given. We also made contact and organized events with individuals and communities outside of Santiago and abroad, uh, particularly in France, Sweden, and the UK, where significant numbers of, of Chileans live. Uh, and many testimonies in the archive have come from ex-detainees living in the diaspora. As Maxine Caradogin shows in his study of Chilean memory scapes, Communities in the Chilean communities in the diaspora actively preserve mnemonic legacy online, using digital archives as one of the few primordial mechanisms to perform truth telling, mourning rituals, and reestablish justice and restorative truth. In 2016, we decided to make the entire project available in English, which has attracted media coverage from non speaking, non Spanish speaking countries and in turn has helped rich survivors base abroad. All these decisions are contributing to increasing participation and growing and diversifying the collection and audience uh, of the project. This has highlighted that Canto Cautivo is, is not just a method to speed up the process of collecting materials and rich potential contributors base anywhere in the world, but a project with a civic and public role. Using music as a key tool, the project publicly recognizes and amplifies the voices of people who experience political detention and torture, displaying their contribution through the web and adding to the collective memory of the dictatorship.
The uh, current software um, of Canto Cautivos was developed in 2017 by computer scientist Hernan Taylor. We took three main decisions. First, we redesigned the web interface, focused on its ease of use, coherence, and dynamicity. Second, we, we, we added full bilingual support. Third, we changed the block-oriented structure of, of WordPress to a category-based relational data model, taking inspirations from the content management system Omeka and using various internet technology, including dynamic HTML, PHP, Google Maps, JavaScript, and YouTube. And we use GitHub as a system repository. So all the current members, uh, Jesse Friedman and Nuria Bonet, who are sub-editors, uh, Lisandro Concati, social media coordinator, uh, Roberto Riveros, uh, so documentary maker, and myself. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm um, presenting the members of the band in a, in a gig. <laughs> um, our project may be classed as archival activism in that we embrace, uh, and I quote, an active social engagement in the process of records creation, capture, description, and dissemination following Fuclus and Gilligan's study on archival activism. Ex-prisoners have been involved in various aspects of the project beyond the production of primary data from contributing to the planning of the website design, being members of the advisory board and reviewing explanatory texts and policies to help helping negotiate partnerships and participating in public events and media interviews. Through time, the project has reached audiences beyond communities of people are directly affected by human rights violations during the dictatorship. It has attracted broad media coverage in local, national, and international outlets. In 2018 and 19, by invitation of the British Museum, the project featured in the exhibition, I Object, addressing acts of creative disobedience uh, spanning a period of three millennia. And our social media channels have been instrumental in engaged audiences. Um, again, all our posts are bilingual. Um, fortunately, I won't have uh, time to talk about this, um, social media. But I will say something about, um, about our approach. Um, and, and due to the high sensitivity about political repression, um, human rights and memory matters, uh, as well as the often unpredictable social media environment, we created an internal social media policy that defines um, parameters for content consent, permission, privacy, language, and style. And, and following, having and following this, this policy has prevented crisis and, and trolls. Um, and and um, our, as of late uh, 2023, our main website users and social media followers are based in the Americas and Europe. Except for our Facebook audience, approximately 70% of our followers are under 45 years of, of, of age, meaning that they did not live through the dictatorship. Through our platform and social media channels, press coverage and the work of pedagogues in Chile and other countries who have incorporated our archival materials into the teaching at school and university levels in various countries, the project has become both informational and educational, contributed in some way to addressing current shortcomings of knowledge about the dictatorship, particularly in, 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 in post-dictatorship generations, and recurrent denials of human rights violations through destruction, the destruction and vandalizers of memory sites and attacks on social media. As an open access site, Canto Cautivos can evidently be used by others in the context of the rapidly evolving technologies around big data and AI, and in the knowledge that these have important associated risks there is an ongoing consideration within our team of how to balance the wish to disseminate the project widely with the paramount need to protect the integrity of participants and their contributions to the archive. Further, the topic of music in captivity has featured in a range of different media, 
from magazines, films, and plays to former detention centers turned into tourist attractions across the world. On occasions, in sensationalist ways that risk trivializing human rights violations. For these reasons, at the bottom of every testimony on Canto Cautivos, we have included clauses specifying the terms and conditions of use. So this is the clause that uh, every every uh, entry has. Through music, uh, so for uh, uh, so say for citations and sharing um, under Creative Commons license, all of intended users of materials require permission from the team and contributors. Through music and stories about music, the Canto Cautivos project engages with and interprets the big history with a capital H, like the coup and human rights violations, as well as small, sometimes micro histories with a small H of daily life experiences, generating a more emotive engagement with human rights and memory topics that potentially allows audiences to sensitize to and comprehend this complex heritage. Music power to generate and elicit feelings connects with emotions that sites of remembrance can cause to visitors. These places have, as Christopher Baraita shows, emotional affordances, that is, the capacity to enable, prompt, and restrict particular emotional experiences in their visitors. Although Bar Bar Baraita's work uh, focuses on a physical site in Berlin, it is helpful for reflecting on the roles that digital media may play in mediating and reshaping visitors' experiences. He shows how memory sites are continuously photographed, digitally shared, and liked on a large scale on social media. He contends that digital media doesn't necessarily ob obfuscate place, and it may even serve to bring the physical presence of heritage sites to the fore, articulating and shaping visitors' emotional experiences of these places. Following Baraita's study, avenues for further research could include explorations of, or, or, of how the Canto Cautivos project as a digital site about analogical heritage sites and its related social media activities and responses from users may mediate people's perceptions and sense-making about former incarceration places and connect with digital memory practices enacted by those who pay physical visits to these sites. Other potential avenues are expanding the project to other countries in, South, in the southern corner of South America that had dictatorship around that time and studying how the project can generate intergenerational dialogues, dialogues and links between the past and the present. Evidently, there could be many more other possibilities, and I would welcome your thoughts on other avenues for research around counterculture, as well as your feedback on how to further minimize risk of potential misuse of its content. And I'll leave it, and I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, many thanks, Katya, for um, providing us a lot of food for thought. It, the thorough, it was such a thorough um, presentation of the project and how you've been critically thinking about all the elements in terms of the development, um, the adequate attribution and collecting ethical collecting practices, but then also the post-use, right, of the site. Um, you all have been considering every, every aspect of it, and I really appreciated it. I have a lot of questions, but before... I jump in, I do wanna open it up to the audience uh, to share, uh, to ask any questions that they might have about the presentation. We'll probably stay uh, maybe five minutes or so answering questions and then we'll we'll conclude uh, today's uh, speaker event. Um, please feel free to uh, uh, unmute yourself or you can put your questions in the chat um, for uh, Dr. Chornick to answer them. I guess I can get started. I can get the conversation started a little bit since we don't have a lot of time. Um, 
lots of questions, but one of them that have that I have here is uh, in terms of contributions, how many how many do you receive? Um, I guess periodically on a monthly basis, et cetera. Oh, it's very, it's been very, very uneven. Um, uh, in the first uh, months of the project, we received probably oh, 60. <laughs> and then it comes and goes. Some, sometimes, I mean, once once um we started uh, using interviews um as a complementary method of of um collecting testimonies. Um. Uh, we uh, we receive many more, and 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 because we've got this 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 system of 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 one record, one object, in this case one 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 song or, or musical piece, then if it's an interview, um, more often than not there will be I don't know three, four, five different pieces, and um. Uh, then we have to edit it so that there is a, a an entry for each of 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 these pieces. Um, um, often um, media coverage brings more people, so it's, it's, there's definitely a, a relationship there um, between um, between um, people's awareness of. And um, I should mention that one of the members of of, of the team, Lisandro Concati, uh, who uh, is responsible for social media he um, um decided to build on on the experience, the methodology and also experience of canto cautivos to create a very very interesting project uh, on the uh, malvinas slash uh Falklands war um and with with very very similar results as in when, when whenever there is press coverage lots of testimonies come by so i mean sometimes we've got months where we have um nothing nothing coming through i have a related question um or i guess a uh, building on that when um individuals submit their testimonies or even when you're interviewing them and you're you're uh, you're building the collection in different ways right as you mentioned them um you mentioned in the license that there's a Creative Commons license that's applied to that. Is that uh, applied by the interviewees themselves, the artists themselves, or is that a condition of uh, contributing to the archive? And also, sorry, as a, as a parallel, is there a possibility for there to be a contribution that is not shared broadly, but it's still archived? So, um, uh, contributors have to read and accept um, another policy which is uh, also related to this. Um, so I'm going to just share it here. Um, can you see it? Times and condition. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the uh, Creative Commons license is mentioned here. So this is a kind, yeah, it's, it's a kind of contract between the contributors and, and the team. So uh, it also mentions that um, they will be contacted by us if the uh, the use the intended use is different from mm -hmm. from straightforward citations or or, or creative common common license um, sharing. But I would I would very much welcome uh, archivists' uh, uh, feedback on on that because it it, it has been a, a big concern, um, of 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 well, how how to minimize risks. Yes, I think I think we we uh, we share that same concern, particularly like you mentioned, right, with the the emergence of I mean it's it's been a long time development, but the emergence and popularization of. Um, artificial intelligence, right? And so how do you prevent that misuse uh, is a big question for all of us. Mm. Um, we do have maybe a couple more minutes. Uh, does anybody else have a question? Yes, Pavel. I'm sorry, I'm happy to answer questions in English or Spanish. Thank you, Kathy. Pavel, go ahead uh, if you want to unmute. 
Yes. Um, hola. Suponiendo que esto es de estudios latinoamericanos, todos entienden un poco, al menos. Eh, primero que nada, felicitaciones, Katia, por tu proyecto y por el cariño y, y la dedicación que se, le, que se le notan mucho. Mira, hay dos cosas que te quiero preguntar. Una es que a partir de lo que tú mostraste, me puse a pensar un poco en la situación, en los, en los distintos recintos, eh, de, digamos, carcelarios, eh, y también los de tortura. Eh, me preguntaba por qué será que, no solo en Chile, sino que eh, prácticamente eh, eh, a través de lo que uno va conociendo del mundo, es eh, eh, como que se topa hasta en Auschwitz con con actividades musicales, con orquestas, con, con una, una posibilidad de, de ejecutar algo que a mí no me, no me es tan claro por qué de parte del poder es permitida. ¿Cuál, es, cuál, es como, cuál será? No, no creo que haya un solo, un, una sola reflexión o un solo raciocinio, pero como que las razones para permitir algo así, siendo que a veces la conversación estaba totalmente prohibida, eh, sin embargo se permite cantar. Eso es lo uno. Y lo otro es que ahora, sin, sin meterme a buscar en tu, o sea, digamos, en el, en el, en el archivo, eh, a mí particularmente me, me, me interesaría eh, saber si el, el candombe para José eh, ha sido como un, un, un tema que, que haya aparecido, que se haya comentado, que, que juegue algún papel, porque yo me he topado en varios testimonios hoy en varios escritos con, con esa canción que es del grupo Iyapu, ¿no? que era una canción muy, muy conocida en su época y que muchas veces hace referencia a que aparece y que es una canción que me gusta mucho, entonces me da curiosidad. A ver, empiezo por la, la segunda pregunta. Hay tres testimonios sobre Candome para José en el archivo. Uno de Tres Álamos en Santiago, otro de Isla Dawson en Patagonia y el tercero también de Tres Álamos. Eh, eh, bueno, es interesante esto del que, que, que eh, diversos testimonios se unen a través de una misma canción. A veces nos ha pasado que eh, dos personas hablan del mismo evento, sobre la misma canción, mismo lugar, misma época, eh, y bueno, Obviamente tienen, tienen, tienen eh, recuerdos distintos y a, a veces han, han tocado disputas eh, por, por la memoria, ¿eh? por pequeños detalles. O sea, que, que es interesante que incluso en, 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 en hacer memoria sobre eventos musicales eh, pueden ocurrir eh, en, en peleas sobre, sobre qué fue lo que realmente pasó. ¿eh? Ahora, sobre tu primera pregunta... ¿Por qué la música estaba permitida? Bueno, en muchos casos era, era parte del sistema. ¿eh? O sea, eh, en, en, en Chile también eh, 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 las autoridades en ciertos lugares eh, obligaban a la gente a cantar. O sea, la, lo que es muy, muy, muy común, el, el, el himno nacional. El himno nacional también es música. ¿eh? Entonces... Eh, eh, bueno, no es, un, no es de extrañar porque que el himno nacional es una de, los, de, los, de, la, de las obras más, eh, más recordadas, en el, al menos en el archivo. Eh, bueno, o sea, la música es súper universal, o sea, desde que te, de, hay, hay, hay recuerdos de, o sea, el, el guardia o el torturador tenía la, la radio eh, prendida. Eh, y bueno, ¿por qué no? Eh, o sea, eh, entonces hay gente que se recuerda de esas cosas. ¿no? Eh, o sea, el permiso o no permiso, de negar permiso no, de, en relación a la música eh, eh, también fue, 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 fue objeto de disputas. O sea, por ejemplo, en el caso de, de este coro, eh, que, que, que discuto en, en, en mi libro eh, estaba permitida la música pero eh, había, una, había un proceso de censura ¿eh? entonces cada vez que tenían que y eso también en otros, en otros campos o sea, antes de cada presentación tenían que eh, 
eh, eh, compartir los, la, la, la lista de canciones y todas las letras de las canciones eh, con las autoridades y las autoridades aprobaban o no aprobaban. Eso. Oh, thank you very much, Albert, for... Yes, <laughs> I try my best to summarize that. Um, I guess that we, we, we've come to time, uh, unless there's another question that somebody wants to make, we will go ahead and close the event. Um, all right. Well, as I said, I also have many questions, but I will follow up with you, Dr. Chornika. But I do want to thank you again for sharing your work with us, uh, phenomenal work, and very methodically thought out about in terms of the ethical practices and collecting, but then also in um, the potential reuse of it. I, I really appreciated uh, that. And, I, and I'm excited to dig into the policies in particular, um, just to try to see how we can emulate some of that with some of the um, collections that we also uh, manage here at Lilas Benson. Well, with that, uh, I, want, I do want to thank everybody who joined us today. Um, the presentation was recorded and we will upload it to our YouTube channel uh, at a future date. Uh, but I do want to thank you for joining us in person and asking uh, the questions that you had. Um, with that said, thank you again, Dr. Chornick. Thank you uh, so much. And yeah. it's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone.